Pratik and Pino's recent dissertation on the essence energies distinction really is the state of the art when it comes to scholarship on the theology of St. Gregory Palamas. So I'll be basing my observations in this video on what Pino has to say on a number of texts, many of which have not yet been translated into English. Pino's dissertation is very welcome, especially as he engages with the issues which previous scholarship had a tendency to polemicize, yet without compromising on any of St. Gregory's teachings. As a result, St. Gregory's theology is actually able to stand out even more starkly without a blurring of the details or any gross misrepresentation. Rather than going through it in full, I wanted to share some of the points where I consider Pino's analysis falls very much in line with what we have seen so far in the Church Fathers with regards to these issues. The first and perhaps most fundamental point I noted was an affirmation of the continuity of power language from the Cappadocians to St. Gregory Palamas. In the case of certain divine powers, dunamis in Palamas is best understood in its literal sense as a faculty. Palamas will therefore describe the divine powers as a capacity or a readiness for some activity. This important definition appears in the letter to Daniel, where Palamas explains that God's powers and energies cannot render God composite, since they are nothing other than a readiness to act. Here he refers specifically to the creative faculty and the faculty of providence, which depend on or work in concert with the divine will. In this way, God's creative and providential energies are not the acts of creation and providence, parche Bradshaw, but God's ability to create and to provide for creatures when he so chooses. Crucially, St. Gregory, even when he doesn't maintain the precise terminology of dunamis and energia, uses equivalent terms to communicate the same concepts. Pino is clear that the application of a distinction between energia and effect serves the same role as the power-energy distinction in the Church Fathers. Gregory's distinction between God's power or energy and the activity or action, to energein, that manifests it, adds an important nuance to the semantic field associated with energia. In the letter to Damianos, energia, identified with dunamis, is distinguished from acting, to energein, in a way that corresponds to the distinction between energy and activity in a frequently cited passage of St. John of Damascus. In his exact exposition of the Orthodox faith, St. John implicitly distinguishes the power of acting from the activity or actions of a particular hypostasis. The power of acting, he says, identified with the energies, is that whereby hypostases act. Yet this action is distinct from the underlying dunamis, so that while a term like energetike dunamis may seem like an oxymoron, it lucidly captures the difference between the energia as potency and its expression as activity. The distinction between an energy and its manifestation is consistent with Palamas's definition of energies as innate powers, faculties, and essential or natural properties. Gregory illustrates this by drawing an analogy with the activity of fire. Although fire, he says, possesses by nature the property of warmth and the ability to heat, this is only manifested when the necessary material is brought near. Although the heating of objects outside itself has a beginning and an end, the fire's warmth as such is both prior to and more enduring than this one act. Indeed, it is an essential property of the fire itself. In the same way, divine activities like the creation of the world are neither the energy dunamis itself nor its effects. Rather, the creation of the world is a manifestation in time of God's eternal creative power. For this reason, Palamas explains, words like creation can be used for both the creative power and the product that results from the divine will. For when God willed, he manifested his creative power through creatures. But just as in the case of Christ's miracles, what is manifested, or what appears, namely the divine energy, is not tantamount to that which comes into being from nothing. In other words, St. Gregory is even more careful than previous writers to nuance his theology of power and energy, so to speak, in order to avoid the connotations of an opposition between act and potency, such as characterizes a certain kind of reading of Aristotle. Indeed, the elision of dunamis and energia more generally alerts us to the need to look beyond an act-potency dichotomy altogether. As Michel Barnes has shown, the language of dunamis itself is not reductively Aristotelian, but goes back 
beyond the paradigm of actualization and change to such sources as the medical language of the Hippocratic school. In this context, power is not simply the opposite of motion and actuality, but the inherent capacity that marks and defines a nature. This denotation is clearly at work in the theology of St. Gregory Palamas, though it is not necessarily opposed to Aristotle. The point, ultimately, is not that Palamas's language of energies is un-Aristotelian, but that the entire background of energies language, and indeed powers language, is much more complex than the caricatured reception of the act-potency dichotomy. He writes on page 61, By far the most common synonym for energy across the many writings of St. Gregory Palamas is dunamis or power. Among the most frequently occurring words in Gregory's entire corpus, it is also the most disruptive for a reductive account of energy as activity, act or operation, concepts that are often set forth as interpretations of energia. As one can already see in the list of energies provided above, many of the things that Palamas identifies as energiae are explicitly described as powers, dunames. These include the creative power and the powers of vision, animation, purification, judgment, retribution and knowledge. Every energy of the Godhead is a list that also includes the demiurgic power, dunamis, and the power of foreknowledge. Likewise, what the saints called divine energies also include God's deifying power and the power of will, and the essence-making power of God is identified with none other than the creative energy. Although the equivalence of dunamis and energia, like that of ousia and phusis, is not absolute, the two terms are, in fact, used interchangeably throughout Gregory's writings. Gregory will therefore speak at one time of the creative power and at another time of the creative energy, or of the providential power and the providential energy. Processions The second point is that the energies are understood by St. Gregory to be more than just providential and economic. This too is crucial to orthodox theology. As Pino observes, Conspicuously absent from the foregoing observations is any protracted discussion of the divine energies as processions, or God's manifestations ad extra. As we have already seen, these terms have sometimes been taken in the secondary literature as a basic equivalent of energia, with energies sometimes being treated as little more than a synonym for the divine processions. This interpretation has strengthened the conviction that the divine energies as such are God's self-revelation his advances to creatures, and theophanies in creation. St. Gregory devotes a great deal of attention to this topic of divine providence and processions, to the extent that some scholars have been led to believe, in Pino's words, that energies as a whole are reducible to God's creative processions, and that the essence energies distinction in general is reducible to the problem of the one and the many. This is especially the case with Eric Pearl, who interprets the category of energy in toto, as the self-diffusion of the one into many in proportion to created realities. This is a mistake, however, as Pino goes on to write. Yet the indivisible division of providence is not the same as the distinction between the one essence of God and its manifold energies. Indeed, Palamas never speaks of a diffusion of the divine usia into multiplicity. Yet while Gregory will make ample use of the providential paradigm to argue that God's energies cannot be identified with his ineffable and non-proceeding essence, he does not equate the category of energy as a whole with providence and its participations. In the end, providence, like deification, is but one of many divine energies, forming a specific subset of what is known around God from eternity. This offers another crucial point of departure from the Augustinian view that was adopted in the West. For this doctrine of many energies implicitly entails that the notions we have of God, in Augustine's terms in thought, cogitatio, refer, if only distantly, to multiple realities, and not to a single referent, which is the divine nature. I think we may fairly say that Augustine's rigid dichotomy between thought, cogitatio, and being, esse, does not lend itself to discussing the energies, and if adhered to strictly, precludes the possibility of understanding this doctrine. This is quite a basic point which comes up very early in the dissertation, without reference to Augustine, however, but it bears repeating. It is perhaps the hardest pill to swallow for those who worry that the essence energy's distinction undermines divine simplicity. Apophaticism I suggested in my video on the medieval power distinction 
that this had to do with a different understanding of apophasticism in the East versus the West. It is therefore very illuminating to see the points of agreement between Barleum and Palamas on the unknowability of the divine nature. As scholars have previously noted, Palamas is not alone in affirming that the divine essence is invisible, unknowable, ineffable, and imparticipable per se. This perspective was shared, at least some of the time, by Gregory's opponents, beginning with Barleum, who insisted that God, as such, cannot be seen or experienced at all. For Palamas, the unknowability of God's essence expresses itself most vividly in the fact that his usia, as such, cannot even be named for it has no name in this present age, nor is it named in the age to come, nor is a word formed in the soul or expressed with the tongue. There is no sort of contact, sensible or intelligible, or any imagining whatsoever, unless one should express by negations its most complete incomprehensibility, which denies of it in a super-eminent manner everything that is or is said in any way. On account of this radical transcendence, the divine Usia is completely nameless, being beyond all names, since it is also altogether inconceivable. Although God is traditionally called Theachia and Anarthachia, he is beyond even these appellations at the level of essence. Indeed, even the terms God, Theos, and Godhead or Divinity, Theotes, do not properly name what God is, since these are titles drawn from his activities. Although the divine essence or nature remains beyond all human conception and language, being known only in the things that surround the essence, the divine energies allow God to be apprehended and hymned as just, wise, loving and merciful from all eternity. Indeed, the divine essence itself is named from these energies. God's eternal attributes include not only the uncreated light and glory of God, or the deifying energy, and the divine processions of providence, but also the full range of things that can be said and known of God. Palamas speaks concretely about these energies, from God's peace and love for humanity to his immortality, infinity and majesty. Such attributes cannot be described as impersonal forces, but are simply the familiar properties of the Christian God. They include the complete list of divine powers, faculties, perfections and essential features that mark the divine nature necessarily and from eternity. The issue with Barleam's approach was that if one applied apophaticism to the energies, it would make God wholly and eternally unknowable, and as St. Gregory suggested, would lead man to atheism. For no man can share in God's essence as such, which Pino translates in one passage as God's quiddity in scholastic terms, his whatness. The broadly Aristotelian resonances of Usia are reinforced by Gregory's definition of essence as what God is. T. Esti. This is often qualified with the phrase, according to essence, although what God is, is never predicated of anything but the divine Usia. God, whatever he is at the level of essence, since he transcends and is removed from everything, is utterly beyond every intellect, every reason, and every manner of union and participation. He is without relation, incomprehensible, imparticipable, uncontemplatable, unknowable, unnameable, and completely ineffable. However, the opponents of St. Gregory fall into a contradiction with the doctrine of divine simplicity. For if they describe the essence in itself as simple, they fall short of apophaticism. For in St. Gregory's view, any predications we make of God are necessarily predicated of the energies. To conflate the attributes with the essence is in a sense to name the essence. Rather, the simplicity of God is something predicated of him insofar as we understand his energies to belong to a single nature. There is, I think, something closely reminiscent here of Platonic discussions of the One, although St. Gregory is not a Platonist by any means. In fact, his core presuppositions, shared with the Cappadocian Fathers, go against the key principle of Platonism, that differentiation necessarily entails division and opposition. 